complete. And turn over to Philippians chapter 2 tonight. I really didn't have peace about the Galatians chapter 4 yet, so hopefully, Lord willing, we'll jump back to that next week. But I did have this one on my heart, so I'd rather be obedient to the Lord and try to, than try to just stick to some uh, little plan that I've made. All right, I'm going to preach to you tonight about consolation in Christ. Now, a lot, that's a word we don't use a whole lot anymore, constellation. Constellation simply means, if I'm saying it right, I know uh, things up in the sky is called constellations. I'm talking about consolation, which means something that consoles you, something that brings comfort to you. So that's what we're going to preach tonight. Consolation in Christ. All right. Philippians chapter 2, verse, verse 1, it says, If there therefore be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of spirit, if any bowels and mercies, uh, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife nor vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of, of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man, and being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the death of the cross. And that's all good preaching right there, but the main verse I look, you look at is verse 1 where it talks about if there be any consolation in Christ. And it tells us why we have consolation in Christ in the rest of the verses we read. But before we get started, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd be with me tonight as I stand before your congregation. And I, Lord, I know well that behind every door there's a broken heart and there's people who have things going on in their lives right now. And they got brokenness about them that maybe none of us here among mortal men can understand. But Lord, we know that you understand and that you care. And we're so thankful for the promise you made there uh, through Apostle Peter where you said we can cast all of our cares upon you because you care for us. Help us to realize there's great consolation to be had in your name and in your grace. It's in Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. And I'm going to take that mint out of my mouth so I don't spit it out and hit one of you. But as I think about our forefathers, as I think about Adam and Eve, I think about how Adam could scarce have understood what the word consolation meant while he was in Eden. For, for the simple reason that before the fall, there was no, he wouldn't have known what the word sorrow was. I mean, everything was perfect. He walked with God in the cool of the evening. There was no sorrow, pain, sickness, or woe. But after the fall, he found his vocabulary, I'm sure, to be stretched through the floods of grief and through tribulation. I mean, he, his first kid that was born murdered the second kid that was born. He knew what it was, was to have a loved one taken in death and in such a, a, a violent way. So he started to understand what grief was when he was put out of the garden, when he saw the death of one of his children. I'm sure he felt sickness upon his days upon the earth. He lived a very long time. He felt what it was like to have pain. So he could understand consolation later on, and he needed consolation. Uh, Adam, when he first needed consolation, though, he could, there was a time when he couldn't find it. Uh, it was that time between the fall and the first promise of the coming Savior. When he felt sorrow with no hope of consolation. And at a time when he knew of no coming Savior, all he knew is that he ate of that fruit that God had forbid him to take of, and that God said the day he would eat of it, he would surely die. Can you imagine how he felt after they took of that fruit? No wonder they hid themselves uh, from God behind the trees there in the Garden of Eden. There was no consolation to be found. But soon he would find the meaning of consolation when God came looking for him. He heard the words of consolation when God said, Where art thou, Adam? Where art thou, Adam? He heard the words of consolation when God said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that the seed of the woman would come and crush the head of the serpent. 
The first promise of the Savior was the first uh, droplings of consolation uh, to the lost soul. Say amen. Real consolation can be found, uh, by the way, nowhere except for in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who came down from heaven and who is now ascended up uh, to uh, heaven on high so he could provide strong and everlasting consolation to all those who would be bought by his precious blood. Say amen. amen. Remember this, the Holy Spirit during his time here upon earth, uh, during, during this time that we're this dispensation we're living in reveal is revealed to us as being the comforter remember what Jesus said he said if I go away I will send another comforter and he shall be in you it's the Holy Spirit's job to console and to cheer the hearts of God's people I'm glad I've got the Holy Spirit on the inside I'm glad that the Holy Spirit is not just in me to make me gobble like a turkey or make some kind of weird noises I'm glad he's in my heart to be my comforter. Now, while the Holy Spirit's the comforter, Christ is the comfort. Let me illustrate this. The Holy Spirit is the physician, but, uh, but Christ is the medicine that is applied by the physician. The Holy Spirit heals our wounds by applying the holy ointment of Christ's grace uh, to our lives. I mean, we're not consoled by new revelation, which a lot of people want, uh, but by old revelation that's explained in force and lit up uh, with new splendor by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Let's take a closer look at this Bible word, consolation, tonight. Our Savior's history is a long and eventful history, folks, but every step of our, Christ, our Lord's journey here upon earth uh, yields abundant consolation uh, to the children of God, to those who've been washed in His blood. If we track Him from the highest throne in glory uh, down to the cross of deepest woe and then to the grave and then again up to the shining steps of heaven through His great and glorious resurrection onward into His uh, priesthood, uh, for of our, his priesthood for us to the day he'll take his throne that eternal uh, everlasting kingdom be established throughout that pathway we'll find consolation we got better days to come folks why are you staring at all the, the ash heaps and the dung heaps of this world realize that we have consolation in Christ we got better things to come I often think about uh, Jesus turning the water into wine. And then after he had turned the water into wine, the governor calling him uh, to himself and saying, uh, you didn't do like everybody else and serve the best wine first. You saved the best for last. And that's what it is for the Christian. Our best is last. I mean, not to say things aren't good now. It's wonderful to have the comforter inside of us. It's wonderful to have him ever present, help in time of trouble. Uh, but I tell you what, the best is yet to come for the saint of God. That's great consolation. So if your body's weak and feeble now, remember one of these days you'll be the picture of strength when you awake in his likeness. If you struggle today, one of these days you'll be like God. If you're poor today, one of these days you have a mansion up on high. That's great and wonderful consolation, isn't it? But we think about throughout every part of the wonderful pathway that Christ trod here upon earth, uh, there may be found flowers of consolation growing that the children of God just have to stoop to glean them and pick them up. Let's begin at the beginning with the fall of man. How it brought sorrow upon sorrow upon the human race. I often thought, as you probably have, if only Adam would not have ate of that, that fruit. You ever thought about that? I've even heard Christians say when they get to heaven, they're going to bust him in the nose. Well, I, I, I don't think that they'll want to bust him in the nose when they get to heaven. But I tell you, if he just wouldn't have ate of that fruit, there'd be no pain, there'd be no death, there'd be no sickness, or no sorrow. You ever thought about that? Now, to combat this grief that's come because of that fall, let's look at our consolation in Christ. First of all, consider this. A look by faith to a time before the foundations of the earth were laid. 
uh, see Christ volunteering to be your sacrifice and becoming the lamb slain before the foundations of the world. Uh, see Christ abiding himself to deliver you even before you were bound by sin. You should, uh, it should bring us great consolation to think of Christ's preemptive mercy. Before man sinned, God had decided he was going to die. It reminds me of a story I heard many, many, many years ago. I think Curtis Hudson told it, but anyways, about this, these two trains that were on a collision course. And it was during the Old West, so they couldn't get a message on a cell phone to the conductor. They were going to crash, and everyone knew it. So what did they do? They, they filled a train full of hospital supplies and put it on one of the tracks. And even though they knew they'd get there too late, they knew that they would get there with supplies shortly thereafter. Well, before, before mankind sinned, Jesus Christ became our hospital train. He came to bind up all of our wounds and fix the whole situation. Before the foundations of the world were laid, Christ Jesus had decided he would make a way of salvation to everyone that believeth. And I said to everyone that believeth, not to some, not to the chosen, but to all who would believe. It should bring great consolation to think about that preemptive uh, mercy. Now, now see him as the Lamb of God, vowing to do the Lord's will, uh, forming, signing, sealing that eternal covenant by which the redeemed would be delivered from the curse of sin forever. That ought to bring you everlasting consolation. If you are a sinner and bound for hell, Christ loved you enough to die for you Amen. and provide a way out. Sometimes uh, it, it, it's sad to think that we can't walk and talk as Adam uh, did with God. You ever thought about that? It must be nice just to have been talking to God. You ever said that to the Lord? I wish I could talk to you like Abraham did. Huh? I guarantee you some of y'all thought that. I mean, we, the just shall live by faith. But it, wouldn't it be nice, though, for you to pray and God come down and say, I heard your prayer. This will be done even as you asked. Wouldn't it be nice to do that? But because we're present in the body and absent from the Lord, we can still have consolation, though. Our Lord still delights in fellowshipping with mankind. I cannot physically see God as Adam did. I cannot hear his audible voice like Adam did. But I know he is there. Say amen. Amen. Think about this great truth. You see uh, Abraham on the plains of Mamir as a pilgrim. But you can always, you can always find Jesus there too uh, because he appeared to Abraham as a pilgrim also on his journey. Uh, Jacob by the brook Jabok was a wrestler. How did Jesus come? As a wrestler too. When Joshua was leading the armies of Israel, how did the Lord appear uh, to uh, Joshua? as the captain of the Lord's host. As the three Hebrew children were cast into the fiery furnace, a Christ there was also in the midst of those fires with them. And even so, you may not see him, you may not touch him, you may not hear him with your ears of flesh, he'll be with you in the fires. He'll be with you in your pilgrimage. He'll be with you there if you buy the river of Jabbok. You know, I think about that. Christ in the fires with the three Hebrew children. He was not there as their king, although he certainly is the king of kings and lord of lords always. He was there uh, with them in the fires. And Christ will go with you in the fires. He walked with these people. He'll walk with you. Uh, he was with them in the midst of their trials. He'll do no less for you. He is no respecter of persons. He'll go with you through the fires. Uh, he will be your rock, your shield, and your high tower as he was to David. He'll bring a, a, you a song and put it in your heart. If you'll just keep your eyes upon him, he'll be your banner and your crown of rejoicing. What consolation we have in Christ. The reason we don't feel the con consoling powers of Christ, the reason we don't feel his presence is because we take our eyes off of him. I mean, my mind always goes back to Peter. There's Peter asking the Lord that if he could walk upon the waters. And while he has his eyes on the Lord, he's walking upon the waters as a man would walk upon pavement. But when he takes his eyes off the Lord and sees the waves and feels the winds, what begins to happen? It begins to sink. 
That's why we have so many Christians who are sinking. That's why we have so many Christians falling by the wayside. They have taken their eyes off the Lord and they begin to sink. And when they sink, they make shipwreck of their life. But consolation can always be found in Christ. Amen. Now let's follow his footsteps out of the ivory palaces of heaven down to the lowly stable in Bethlehem and see him there as a little babe in the manger. The eternal God robed in flesh as a little baby, 100% God, 100% man, yet without sin. Amen. I always have to say yet without sin when I say 100% man because he was without sin. Not one impure thought ever came into his mind. Never did he ever step out of the will of God. He always did what pleased the Father. Amen. He was perfect in all of his ways. Philippians 2, 6 through 8, we read all those verses. It says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robber to be equal to God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. In his flesh he was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. He had weariness, he had sickness, he had sadness. This ought to be a great consolation to you. You say, why? That he experienced that? Because he knows what you're going through. Amen. Whatever you are going through, Christ has been through it to the extreme. I've said this oftentimes. Have you ever been betrayed by somebody? Well, Christ was betrayed by one of the 12. He lifted up his heel against him. You ever been stabbed in the back? I believe uh, Judas stealing uh, from the purse he was carrying as the treasure and turning over Christ for 30 pieces of silver surely does show someone getting stabbed in the back. He knows what that's like. You ever been sick? He knows what it's like to be sick. In the garden of Gethsemane, he sweated great drops of blood. Hey, have you ever been under stress? He knows what stress is all about as he looked into that bitter cup and prayed uh, for it to be removed from him. But yet, when it was not removed, he drunk it all the way down to the bottom. He knows what you're going through. Have someone wayward in your life? Christ looked down at Jerusalem and wept and said, Oh, how often will I gather you together? He felt grief. He died upon the cross uh, for you. He suffered for you. Do you think that you should not ever suffer? Jesus said the servant is not above his master. They hated him. They're going to hate you. Don't expect not to have trouble. He died upon the cross. Are, are you above bearing one for him? He was crowned with thorns. Do you expect to always wear a royal diadem around and strut around? He was pierced with cruel nails. Do you expect to feel no pain here in this earth? Look past your sorrow and look to Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith, and you'll find consolation. Amen. Something that will console you. If you're a son of poverty, he stands before you in his seamless garment, the garb of a peasant. You may be poor, but Christ was poor. Nobody in here, I don't think, could say what Christ said when he said, the foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man hath not anywhere to lay his head. Amen. The poor of us, poorest of us, can find comforts in the Lord Jesus Christ. You may go home to a hovel after this church tonight, but you have sweet consolation. You have a mansion waiting you on high one day. Amen. Your frame may be frail and feeble, but one of these days you can have consolation that you'll have a body like Jesus' glorious body. Amen. Now look past the robe of poverty to that scene when the garments were torn away from him. There's another place where he becomes consolation for us. He was plunged into the deepest depths of woe as he was scourged with a knotted whip. See him as they punched him in the face and mocked him and spit in his face. See him as a crown of thorns was platted upon his brow. See him as they drive those cruel nails into his hands and feet. See him hanging between the heavens and the earth, writhing in anguish and in pain. He endured there all of the sorrow and pain that any man could endure so he could bring us sweet consolation. There he made a way for sinful man to be redeemed. Do you have this consolation? 
Do you have it? You say, I can't find nothing to console me in this world. Well, you don't know Jesus. You've gotten away from him. You've lost sight of him. Say, nothing can make this situation any better. Yes, there's one who can make it better. The one in whom all things are possible. The one who holds all things together by the word of his power. Amen. He is your God. So you ought to be able to find sweet consolation in that. When you ponder death, do you have consolation? When you think about dying, are you concerned? Are you worried? Well, there's no need to worry. You can have consolation. Uh, that Death is nothing more than just a low porch you have to stoop under to get to glory. Christian, I'm persuaded that if we would look more often to the foot of the cross, we would see less trouble with our doubts and fears and our woes. We would find the sweet consolation that we all desire to have in Christ. If we would only have to see his sorrow to lose our sorrow. We'd only have to see his wounds to be healed of our own. Let Christ be your consolation. Let him be your comfort. As we pray.